Okay, so welcome to this next video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is vasoactive intestinal peptide and pituitary adenylate cyclase activating protein receptors. Okay, and for short, vasoactive intestinal peptide is abbreviated to VIP and pituitary adenylate cyclase uh, activating protein is abbreviated to PACAP. Okay, right, so we're going to talk about VAP and PACAP receptors. Okay, right, so the structure then for this video, we're going to start off with a basic discussion of what vaso in, uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide and uh, pituitary adenylate cyclase activating protein are. Okay, so we'll start off by discussing the ligands. Then we'll look at the different receptors for these two um, ligands uh, and their G protein coupled receptors. So we'll then discuss G protein coupled receptors. We'll discuss the different families of G protein coupled receptors. We'll see how all of these um, VIP and PACP, sorry, PACAP receptors fall into the secretin family of G protein coupled receptors. And we'll then discuss uh, the pathways which these uh, receptors all activate. Okay, right. So we'll start then with vasoactive intestinal peptide, VIP. Okay, so this stands for vasoactive, that's the V. Uh, the I stands for intestinal, okay, and the P stands for peptide. Okay, so the name gives you a clue as to the nature of this ligand peptide tells us that we are dealing with a uh, sequence of amino acids, okay? So we're dealing with uh, a polypeptide, basically, a, um, a polymer of amino acids joined together. So we can draw a little picture like this for vasoactive intestinal peptide. We have an amino terminus over here and a carboxylic acid terminus over here. And in total, the number of amino acids that you have polymerized together to make the vasoactive intestinal peptide is 28, okay? So it consists of 28 amino acids. That means that if you worked your way along here, counting the amino acids, you'd get 28 of them as you went the whole way across. So it's a small little uh, peptide, basically. It's a small polymer of amino acids. Right, now, it has a whole plethora of functions, okay, and it's what's known as a new, well, most of its functions are what are known as neuroendocrine hormonal functions. Okay, so what does this mean? What does it mean to say that vasoactive intestinal peptide is a neuroendocrine hormone? So the concept of a neuroendocrine hormone is, uh, well, firstly, we need to discuss what a hormone is to discuss what neuroendocrine uh, hormone means. A hormone is a molecule that is generally secreted into the blood and which travels in the blood to a far off distant portion of tissue and then causes some change on that the level of that tissue. So it's a way by which one tissue can communicate with another tissue and cause a change in that second tissue. Okay, so a neuroendocrine hormone means a hormone that is released by neurons rather than by, um, well, by more, well, by glandular tissue, basically. Okay, so um, it's going to be a hormone secreted by neurons. Okay, right. Uh, in addition, vasoactive intestinal peptide is also found to be a neurotransmitter, okay, so it can be involved in uh, signaling between two neurons at a synapse, okay. Uh, so, let's now discuss um, how uh, you make vasoactive intestinal peptide, because basically, what you first synthesize is a much larger polypeptide, and then you cut this larger polypeptide up and get smaller little fragments, and this smaller fragment, one of them, is vasoactive intestinal peptide, okay, or VIP. So the initial 
polypeptide that you make and then cut up to release a vasoactive intestinal peptide is called pre-pro vasoactive intestinal peptide, so pre-pro-VIP or VIP. Okay, so let's have a look at the structure then of pre-pro-VIP. So let's have the amino terminal uh, of the protein here, okay? And now, close to the amino terminus of the protein, you have a special region which is known as the signal peptide. Now, this is the region that targets the protein into the ER. So any protein that's going to be secreted from the cell or which is destined for the cell membrane has to go into the ER, okay? And therefore needs a signal peptide which sends it to the ER. Okay, right. Uh, then after the signal peptide, what you have is a region which I'll come to in a moment. So we'll come to this region here. Okay, we're interested in this region after this second region here, this third important region, which is the portion that's actually going to correspond to the vasoactive intestinal peptide. So here is VIP. So basically to make VIP, we just need to cut here and also, of course, here. And then we'll um, cut this smaller little polymer of amino acids out of the much bigger polypeptide. Okay, and then you'll have the C-terminus of pre-pro uh, VIP over here. Okay, now what I want to do is come back to this section here, because this section is actually used to uh, make other uh, peptide um, neuroendocrine hormones and neurotransmitters, uh, which are also active on these VIP, PACAP receptors. So we should discuss these two other peptides that you can produce from this region. So basically, you can either make a peptide where you use the entire region here. Okay, so if you cut out this entire region here and use that as your um, peptide, then the peptide that you get is known as peptide histidine valine. Okay, uh, and peptide histidine valine is often abbreviated to PHV for short. So peptide histidine valine, or PHV. Now, if instead you cut a smaller fragment, so if instead, there is a, imagine that there's a line down here, and instead you cut here and here, rather than here and here as you did with orange. Okay, so if you cut this smaller fragment here, you get another uh, peptide that is often secreted with vasoactive intestinal peptide. And this is known as peptide um, histidine methionine. Okay, so this is peptide histidine methionine. And again, for short, peptide histidine methionine is often called PHM. Whoops, what have I done here? Methionine, yes, cross out that E and put an E in there. Okay, so this is often abbreviated to PHM for short, peptide histidine methionine. Okay, right. So that's the structure of pre-pro-VIP. Okay, so we can cut it up, we can release vasoactive intestinal peptide from cutting up the pre-pro-vasoactive intestinal peptide, but also from a totally different portion of this pre-pro-VIP, we can also produce either peptide histidine valine or peptide histidine methionine, and these two are often secreted along with vasoactive intestinal peptide, and these are going to act along with vasoactive intestinal peptide on some of these vasoactive intestinal peptide pituitary adenylate cyclase uh, activating protein receptors. Okay, and we'll see that later. Okay, so we're going to go come away from vasoactive intestinal peptide and these two related peptides uh, for a moment, and we're going to go and have a look now at PACAP instead. Okay, so PACAP stands for pituitary, that's the P, okay? The AC then stands for adenylate cyclase, which is just another name for adenylyl cyclase. It's a little trivial whether you want to call it adenylate or adenylyl, okay? So pituitary adenylate cyclase, and then the AP then stands for activating protein, 
So this stands for the pituitary adenylate cyclase activating protein, or the PACAP. Right, okay, so what I now want to discuss again is the fact that PACAP is again a peptide. It's made um, out of a polymer of amino acids, so you stick many amino acids together to produce PACAP. And once again, you do not produce PACAP initially. What you do is you first produce a much larger polypeptide, you then cut this polypeptide up to produce PACAP. Now there are two different types of PACAP, one that's 27 amino acids long, which is known as PACAP 27, okay, and one which is slightly longer, it's 38 amino acids long, and this is known as PACAP38. Okay, so these are the two forms of PACAP. Now, for the first 27 amino acids, PACAP38 is identical to PA, PA, sorry, PACAP27. Okay, it then just has an additional 11 amino acids on the end. So let's see how this works by looking at uh, pre-pro PACAP. Okay, right. So, once again, at the amino terminus of pre-pro PACAP, you have a signal peptide. And the function, again, of this signal peptide is to send the newly produced pre-pro PACAP to the endoplasmic reticulum for processing, um, and then it will be sent on to the uh, cis-Golgi, uh, and then it will work its way through the Golgi to be secreted out onto uh, the external world. Okay, right, so this is the signal peptide, and let's colour in the signal peptide in turquoise here. Okay, right, uh, then after the signal peptide, what we then have is a region that codes for another peptide that is related to PACAP. Okay, so this portion here. And let's colour this in, in vivid purple. Okay, right. And this portion that's related to PAP, sorry, PACAP, uh, because of course it comes from the same pre-pro uh, protein, this is known as PACAP-related protein or PACAP-related peptide, whichever you want to use. Okay, right. And then after this portion that makes the PACAP-related peptide, you then have the portion which is involved in making PACAP. Okay, now, depending, of course, where you cut this, you either make PACAP-27 or PACAP-30, uh, sorry, 38. Okay, so this first portion that I'm highlighting in pink, although it's very difficult to tell the difference between pink and vivid purple, this portion, if you just use this portion, this will make the shorter PACAP27. If you then include the, the final 11 amino acids here, which I'm now colouring in in turquoise, uh, the full thing, the first pink bit plus this green bit, will then make PACAP38. Okay, so again, depending on how you cut the pre-pro PACAP, you can get different PACAP proteins. You can get the PACAP27 or the PACAP38. Now, both of these were originally named because of their ability to activate adenylylcyclase in the anterior pituitary cells. Okay, right. So, what we now want to discuss is the different receptors that are receptors for both vasoactive intestinal peptide and PACAP27 and PACAP38. And from now on, we're not going to distinguish between PACAP27 and 38. So if I just write PACAP, that means either PACAP27 or PACAP38. If I'm feeling good, I might put PACAP27 forward slash uh, 38 to say one or the other. Okay, right. So there are three receptors uh, which are involved in detecting and responding to vasoactive intestinal peptide and PACAP. Okay, um, and these are called the vasoactive intestinal peptide P 
PACAP receptor 1. So the V here stands for the fact that it's a receptor for VIP, and the PAC stands for the fact that it's a receptor for PACAP. Okay, uh, so there's VPAC1, then we have another one, VPAC2. Okay, again, it's a receptor for both VIP and also PACAP. Okay, and then finally you have a receptor that is not a receptor for vasoactive intestinal peptide, but is only a receptor for the two forms of PACAP, and this is called PAC1. Okay, so the naming makes complete sense there. It tells you uh, what these receptors are sensitive to. Okay, so VPAC1 and VPAC2, these are um, sensitive to both vasoactive intestinal peptide, VIP, and they're also sensitive to PACAP, okay? Uh, but more than that, they're also sensitive to the peptides which are related to VIP. So remember, we discussed these. We discussed peptide histidine methionine here, okay? So PHM, which was the shorter version here. It came just from this portion that's being highlighted in blue here. And then we had the longer version, which also included on the end this portion in green, which was the peptide histidine valine, PHV. Okay, so VPAC1 and VPAC2 are also both sensitive to uh, peptide histidine valine and also peptide histidine methionine, PHM. So all of these different peptides are capable of activating these two receptors. Whereas PAC1 is really only sensitive to PACAP of both the 27 and the 38 form. Okay, and it's around 100 times more sensitive to PACAP than it is to um, VIP. And with regards to these, you know, these little related ones, they're not really vegans at all for PAC1. Okay, right. Now, all of these three receptors, VPAC1, VPAC2, PAC1, they are all G-protein coupled receptors. So what we're now going to have a discussion of is the general features of G-protein coupled receptors. We're then going to discuss heterotrimeric G-proteins uh, and the activation of heterotrimeric G-proteins in the G-protein cycle. And then we'll see which heterotrimeric G-proteins these free receptors actually activate. And they all activate the same heterotrimeric G proteins, which are the GS heterotrimeric G proteins, and we'll then see the downstream pathways of that activation. Okay, right, so let's start by discussing G protein coupled receptors. Okay, so G protein coupled receptors are a massive family of receptors. Okay, uh, there are over 800 different G protein coupled receptors in the human body alone. Okay, and those are the ones that are known. So it is a massive, massive family of proteins. Never mind receptors, it's a massive family of proteins. But they are all receptors. Okay, and they all have different ligands. And these three receptors that we've just studied VPAC1, VPAC2, and PAC1, they're all examples of G protein coupled receptors. And by the way, just for your knowledge, G protein coupled receptors are often abbreviated to GPCRs for short. G for G, P for protein, C for coupled, and R for receptor. Okay, right. Uh, so let's start by discussing the general feature that all 800 of the G protein coupled receptors that we have in humans share, and then we'll go on to looking at the different families of G protein coupled receptors and which of these families the uh, VIP and PACAP receptors uh, fall into. Okay, right. And I should just stress that these free receptors, these are the VIP and PACAP receptors, okay? Even though PAC1 is really just a receptor for PACAP, it does have some affinity for VIP. So these are the VIP and PACAP uh, receptors. Okay, right. 
so let's now continue with our discussion of G-protein coupled receptors. So, G-protein coupled receptors sit in the cell membrane. These two lines here are supposed to represent the outer leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and then the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, now the characteristic feature that all G-protein coupled receptors share is that the amino terminal, um, this amino terminus rather, of the polypeptide of the G-protein coupled receptor will be extracellularly. Okay, then what you'll have is uh, a membrane-spanning alpha helix like so. Okay, so even though I've drawn a straight line, in reality, this will be an alpha helical structure like a spring. Okay, like this, which spans the membrane. This portion here will be like that. Okay, uh, and this line, by the way, is meant to represent amino acid after amino acid after amino acid after amino acid. Okay, and that's an important point to make uh, sure you understand that each G protein coupled receptor is a single polypeptide. So they're not complexes, they are a single polypeptide. Okay, right. Then you loop back around and have a second membrane spanning alpha helix. Then you loop around a third membrane spanning alpha helix, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and then a seventh. Okay, so this is the really characteristic feature that all um, G protein coupled receptors share. They have these seven membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, so I'll highlight these in. So these portions that are going across the phospholipid bilayer, which I'm now highlighting in turquoise, these are the membrane-spanning alpha helices. Okay, right, and you have seven of the things. So seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. Okay, spanning alpha helices. And it's not quite understood what the significance of these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices is because, you know, nature has run with this structure. It's found this structure and it has run with it. But why would this structure was so successful? We don't really understand that. Okay, why seven? Why not eight or nine or whatever? Okay, but seven is the conserved number that all G protein coupled receptors have. Okay, right. So, let's discuss a bit of nomenclature now. Uh, so firstly, we'll begin with the naming of these seven membrane-spanning alpha helices. Okay, so the first membrane-spanning alpha helix is labelled up TM1, and this will stand for transmembrane, that's the TM, and then you can imagine having alpha helix 1. So this stands for transmembrane alpha helix 1. Then you'll have TM2, which will be the second membrane-spanning alpha helix, TM3, the third, TM4, the fourth, TM5, the fifth membrane-spanning alpha helix, TM6, the sixth membrane-spanning alpha helix, and TM7, the seventh membrane-spanning alpha helix. Okay, so I might just label up the seventh one. I won't label up absolutely all of them, because it will just end up a mess if I do that. But we have at least TM1 and TM7 labelled up now. Okay, right. Uh, in addition, uh, we have names for these loops that are in between the membrane-spanning alpha helices. Okay, so the ones that are on the intracellular side of the cell membrane, which I'm now highlighting up in purple, are called the intracellular loops. Okay, so these are the intracellular loops. I'll put this here. So intra means within. Okay, so this means within the cell loop. Okay, and for short, the intracellular loop is abbreviated to the ICL, uh, and then we'll, this will be the first one here. So this is the intracellular loop 1, because this is the one that's closest to the amino terminus. The second intracellular loop here will be labelled up intracellular loop 2, and then so on, onto the third one, the ICL3. Okay, we also have names for uh, the extracellular loops here. Okay, so between the second and the third membrane spanning alpha helix, the uh, fourth and the fifth, and the sixth and the seventh. Okay, these are the extracellular loops, and these are abbreviated to ECLs. Okay, so we have ECL1 to 3, basically. Here is ECL1, here is ECL2, and here is ECL3. Okay, right. Finally, then, this portion that's prior to TM1 here, Okay, not colouring it in, in vivid purple. This portion in red here. 
okay? This is known as the amino terminal domain, okay? Often abbreviated to ATD, okay? So this stands for amino, um, and then terminal is the T, and then domain is the D. Now, some people will even call this uh, the ATED, okay? So you'll sometimes maybe see this referred to as ATED. Now, what does that stand for? Well, the A still stands for amino, the T still stands for terminal. The E, what does the E stand for? Well, basically here, the E stands for ecto. So you'll call it the amino terminal ecto domain instead of just the amino terminal domain. Okay, and that's because ecto means on the outside, and this is clearly on the outside of the cell. So this is sometimes called the ATED for amino terminal ecto domain. Okay, but more commonly just called the amino terminal domain. Okay, now moving on. The final portion that I haven't yet covered in is this portion down here uh, that's now been highlighted up in yellow here. Okay, and this portion is known as the C terminal domain. Okay, and I should have had a dash between amino and terminal. So C terminal domain. And for short, of course, C terminal domain is often abbreviated to CTD. Okay, so those are the different parts of a G protein coupled receptor. All of those free receptors we've just talked about the names of and their ligands. The VPAC1, the VPAC2, and the PAC1, they all look like this. They all have these little bits that we've just been discussing. Okay, right. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have a break now, and in the next video what we're going to begin our discussion of is the different families of G-protein coupled receptors.